Hi guys. So today I'm going to tell you guys a story that I haven't told before, and that is my life story about dogs. Um, I've told everyone my story about mink and how I got into mink, but I've never really told my story about dogs and how I got into dogs and, and my experiences with them. So I thought I would take this opportunity. I was actually talking to a good friend. He asked me a similar question, you know, how did you get into to pit bulls specifically, he asked me, and I told him the whole story. And while telling him that story, I got thinking, you know what? It would be interesting for me to tell a similar story, basically how I got into dogs in general, to you guys here on YouTube. So I'm going to take that opportunity and share that with you guys here on YouTube, as well as my, uh, my special clubs that I have. So I hope you guys enjoy this story. So when I was a little, little boy, I grew up with my parents, and um, I'm the oldest son. I'm actually the oldest of 10 children, nine boys and one little girl at the very end. So being the eldest son, my dad was actually still in college when I was born. So uh, we were basically renting all through my childhood. Um, our first place was, a, was an apartment. Um, we then eventually moved into a house. But when we lived in a house, it was a rented house. And so my dad, because of that, wouldn't let me have a dog because we were always renting and the, the landlords wouldn't let us have dogs. And I always wanted a dog growing up. Now, when I would go visit my grandfather, he always had working dogs. Specifically, my grandfather was a horse trainer, so he had cattle dogs. And I loved going and seeing his dogs and playing with his dogs. And pretty much anyone who had dogs, I loved going to their house and playing with their dog. Because I, ever since I could remember, really, really wanted a dog. Um, as I continued to grow and mature, I had various little wild animal pets. Basically, because my, my dad couldn't really say, you know, no you can't do that like you could with dogs. So for example, if I wanted a pet squirrel, I could just go find a pet squirrel and bring it home. What can my dad say? I already had the squirrel, right? But it wasn't so easy to do that with dogs, at least not where I lived. I'm sure certain countries or parts of the country, it would have been easy for me to go pick up a stray or something and bring it home. But where I lived, they didn't really have stray dogs or anything like that. So I couldn't just bring a dog home and you know spring it on my dad. That wasn't really possible. Um, otherwise, I probably would have had a pet dog a lot earlier on. You know, just let it roam the neighborhood and feed it if I'd have lived in a culture where that was allowed. So I always wanted a dog. Um, when I was little, I dreamed of getting a Labrador Retriever. Um, when I was a little old boy living in Missouri, uh, between the ages of like four and, and seven, um, my favorite thing to do is go out and catch box turtles. And I read in a magazine, this little magazine they had for kids called Ranger Rick. It was about wildlife and animals and stuff like that. In my Ranger Rick magazine, there was an article about a lady who studied box turtles. And she used Labrador retrievers to go and find and retrieve these box turtles, who she would then study and um, put tags on them and, and study where they lived and all these things. And I was in, intrigued with that idea of getting a Labrador and having it help me find turtles and snakes and other little animals that I was capturing as a child. And now I dreamed of having a Labrador Retriever. Um, as I grew and matured, I eventually grew an interest in raccoons and I wanted to use a Labrador to help me find raccoons because I knew they had a good nose and they can track. And I was, I don't know why I didn't think of getting a coon hound, but for some reason I stuck with the Labrador dream. I wanted a Labrador to help tree raccoons so I could catch a raccoon. And all these funny little dreams I had as a kid, but never could come true because my dad, um, he wouldn't let me have a, a dog, mostly because, like I said, we were renting houses. And so the renters or the, the landlords wouldn't allow us to have a dog. As I got a little bit older, one day I decided, you know, I was probably about 12 or 13 years old, something like that. Uh, I decided, you know what? Why do I want a Labrador? Why specifically a lab? You know, I've never really researched dogs to see what the other dogs uh, breeds out there are like. So why not research and, and make an educated decision on what my favorite dog is rather than just this uh, Labrador that I somehow made up in my mind was what I wanted. So I started researching dogs and I read that, you know, in the, li in the library, the children's library, school library and the public library both, they had all these books about different breeds. And I remember there was a series, I don't remember what the series was called, but there was like a book for every breed, you know, that, that they listed. I'm sure it wasn't every breed in the world, but you know, all the common breeds. So they had a book on Labradors and I read that book 
And then I read about golden retrievers, and then I read about German shepherds, and I, I went through the whole series and read each book about all these different breeds. I, I read about like everything from poodles to Rottweilers to Mastiffs, uh, Jack Russell Terriers, like every, of, every one of the common breeds that they had in this series. I read every single book. Uh, even dogs that didn't sound interesting to me, like maybe a Shih Tzu or a Pug that's like, ah, I don't have any interest in that. I would read through it at least a little bit to make sure I knew the basics of that, that specific breed before I just counted it out as something I wasn't interested in. And I read about beagles and, and all of these different dogs. And um, it was a very interesting little uh, adventure I was going on as this, this young boy reading about all these different breeds. And my real goal with it was to pick my favorite breed. Because up until this point, I always had Labrador Retriever as my favorite, but I didn't really have a reason for it to be my favorite. I, it was just uh, something I decided uh, obscurely. I, I'm just randomly gonna pick the lab. Well, I wanted to pick, edu I wanted to educate myself and make an educated decision on what my favorite breed was. So as I was reading through all these books, there was one book in this section that was about pit bulls. And I was like, oh, those dogs are stupid. They're mean and they kill people and they're vicious. I have no interest in pit bulls. But like I said, I read about Shih Tzus and Pugs, a breed that I was very confident I wasn't interested in. So I thought, well, I'll do the same thing with pit bulls. And they said things like pit bulls, you know, love children and they're, they're good with people and all these things. And I'm like, they're smart and easy to train. And I'm like, man, this book is just a liar. All these people, they're just lying about pit bulls and saying they're nice and saying they're, they're easy to train and all of these things. That's not true. I know better. I know that pit bulls are mean and they kill people. And so I, I threw the book aside and thought, what a bunch of liars. What a bunch of bull crap. Well, around that time, um, our neighbor, they, they used to have a German shepherd that I was terrified of. He was always trying to, if he got out, he would like try and attack us and he was always barking through the fence and I, I hated that dog. Well, that dog got old and died, and our neighbor got a new puppy, and it was a pit bull puppy. And this was about the time that I'd read the book about that pit bull. So I had this in the, planted in the back of my mind that maybe, just maybe, my misconception about pit bulls being evil and killing people might be wrong. Now, I wasn't convinced that I was wrong. I was convinced that I was right, but I still had it in my head that maybe I was wrong. I had that little seed planted. And when I saw that cute little pit bull puppy, I thought, ah, oh, those guys are idiots. What are they doing getting a pit bull? It's going to kill people. It's going to be vicious. And I saw them playing rough with the puppy and letting them chew on their, their coat sleeves. And I'm like, oh, they're teaching that dog to be mean. It's going to be vicious and horrible. And so I still had this negative thought and belief about pit bulls. So as I got to know this neighbor's dog, because I didn't have a dog of my own, it was very normal for me to get to know the neighbor's dogs and play with them. Um, I couldn't do that previously because they had this mean German Shepherd, but now that they had a new dog that was puppy and growing up, even though I, in the back of my head, I was like, ah, I hate pit bulls, they're mean, they're vicious, I still didn't have any other dogs to play with. None of my other neighbors had pit, pet dogs. So um, it, I was basically forced <laughs> to play with this dog because I didn't have any friends or any neighbors that, that I was, you know, comfortable with that had dogs that I could go play with. So this was literally the closest dog and most available dog for me to play with. So naturally, I would go over there and play with their dog. You know, <laughs> most kids knock on their neighbor's door, hey, can, can Timmy or Susie play? I would knock on the door and say, hey, can I go play with your dog? <laughs> and they're like, okay, weird neighbor kid, go play in our backyard, that's fine. So I would go and play with their dog in their backyard. And, um, I played with that dog and I loved that dog just because it was the only dog I had access to. But I still had in the back of my head, this, is, this dog's gonna grow up to be dangerous. This dog's gonna grow up to be mean. But over time, as it did grow up, and I learned that this particular pit bull didn't grow up to be mean. It in fact was really happy-go-lucky, loved people, loved me more than anyone else and listen to me better than its own owners. It wouldn't listen to its owners. Its owners would tell it to do stuff, it would just ignore them. I would tell it to do stuff and I'd already trained it to, to fetch and to release. Like it loved to play tug of war with everything. You grab a stick and it would play tug of war with it. But I taught it to release 
or you know throw the stick and he would bring it back or a ball or whatever toy so i'd play tug of war with it and then say release and he'd let go and i'd play fetch with it and he'd bring me the ball back and it would want to play tug and i'd say release and he'd let it go and i'd teach him to sit and i'd tell him to come and so this dog listened to me better than it did its owners this dog loved me more than it did its own owners and so as i bonded with this dog pretty soon as you can imagine um my my biases towards pit bulls was starting to disappear so finally once this dog was a full-grown adult and i saw hey he didn't turn mean he didn't attack anyone he was actually a really cool dog who really loves me and i really love him his name was jake was the dog's name i loved jake and jake loved me maybe i ought to reread that pit bull book because to be honest when i first started reading it i really only read like the first page and it said all this dumb stuff what i thought was dumb stuff about pit bulls being nice and loving people and loving kids and i just threw the book down after like maybe a page or a couple paragraphs of of that what i thought was bull crap and i said you know what i'm not going to read this bull crap this book is just a full of lies and i maybe skimmed through it briefly but i didn't read much more than that because i was convinced the the author of that book was a liar well, now that I got to know Jake and I fell in love with Jake and, and he was such a good buddy, I thought, you know what? Maybe I ought to give Pitbulls a chance. Maybe I ought to reread that book. So I picked up the Pitbull book and I reread it, this time cover to cover, every word. And lo and behold, after reading all of these different books, I finally found my favorite breed of dog. And it happened to be the breed that I hated and I thought was evil and wicked and vicious and horrible, the pit bull. After reading that book, I read other books and I read more and more and more and they all seemed to agree. And I saw that what the books claimed were the same, uh, the, the claims in the books were the same as what I saw in my neighbor's dog, Jake. And pretty soon I fell in love with pit bulls. They became my new favorite dog. So here I was still longing to have a dog we moved to a new home and at this point it was our home my dad purchased his first home but he still wouldn't let me have a dog i'm not sure what the reasoning was at this point you know previously his excuse was always that we were renting well now we weren't renting but he still wouldn't let me have a dog and i wanted a dog so bad at this point like i said i'd studied all the breeds and i decided my favorite dog was a pit bull and you know I don't know what I read in those books that made me think pit bulls were my favorite. I think really it came down to my experience with Jake, the neighbor dog. That's what made me really fall in love with pit bulls is my assumption. But honestly, I don't remember. I was, like I said, 12, 13 years old at the time. This was a long time ago. So now, that looks like Bindi wants down again. I'll let her down. So now I become absolutely obsessed with pit bulls. I want a pit bull. And so I started going to... Uh, dog shelters and looking at the dogs at the shelter and anytime they had a dog that was looked like a pit bull I was all excited and I would go and get to know that dog and I would go and play with that dog every day I'd ride my bike it was a long it, it was like a 15 minute car drive to the shelter and I rode my bike the whole way so I don't know like an hour bike ride <laughs> you know hour and a half I rode my bike all the way to the dog shelter not every day but you know at least a couple times a week and I would play with my favorite pit bull. And then th that pit bull would get put to sleep or adopted or whatever, and it'd be gone. And then I'd be sad, and I would go and visit from time to time until finally they would get another pit bull looking dog in. And then I would go visit that dog and play with it, you know, once or twice a week or every other week. I was just obsessed with pit bulls. I also learned where there were pit bulls around the neighborhood. And I would look at, <laughs> and I would watch the pit bulls through the fence and longingly wish that I could have my own pit bull. There was a, a pit bull that was on a chain outside their house without a fence in yard. It was, it was an unfenced yard and the dog was just on a chain. And that dog was uh, right by where I walked every day to school. So I, st I started making another pit bull friend. Um, I would bring that dog little treats and snacks and I'd go pet him. And, and every day on my way to school, I'd stop and give him a little something to eat and give him a pet, you know, bring him some dog food or, or, or some meat scraps from dinner or whatever and I'd pet him on the head and, and love him up and then I'd go on to school and then on my way home I'd stop and see the dog again. This dog, I didn't know the owners. I just snuck in their backyard and played with their dog. So I don't even know what the dog's name was. He actually was a similar color to Jake. He was brindle and white just like Jake. Uh, and I think this dog was a female if I remember right but, but I have no idea what her name was. 
But I play with her every day after school. And this this is how obsessed I was with wanting a pit bull. That everyone who had one, or a dog that looked like one at least, uh, I would go and play with it and, and love it. And so began my absolute obsession with, with pit bulls and wanting one. And so I was really frustrated that my dad wouldn't let me have a dog. So I finally decided I was going to get a dog anyway. And I came up with a plan. There was a little wooded lot down at the end of our street where... I felt like it was pretty private and secret and a little woods that no one really went to and I thought you know what I can get a dog and I'll build a little dog house and have a chain out there and I will hide this dog from my dad and I'll keep it out there and then I'll, I'll bring it sneak it into my bedroom you know when my dad isn't around or you know and, and I take the dog on walks and go play play at the park and stuff I had this whole plan in my head how I was gonna get this pit bull secretly and my plan was I'd go to the animal shelter and I'd save up my money and I'd adopt a dog from the shelter and then, you know, like I said, sneak it out into the woods and not let my dad know I had it. So that was my plan. And like I said, once again, I'm like 13, 14 years old at this time. Um, but I found out, unfortunately, that animal shelters do not adopt to juveniles or at least not juveniles that are 13 or 14. I don't know. Maybe they would if I was 17 or something, but... At 13, 14 years old, they would not adopt a dog to me. And I was heartbroken. I thought, oh, I finally found a way. And no, here I was, I tried to sneak it. And I'd, I'd, I think I'd even bought the chain and a bag of dog food and stuff. And I was all ready. And the shelter denied me. No, we don't adopt to little kids, sorry. Oh, I was heartbroken. I thought I'd finally found a way I could finally have a dog. But alas, I was, I was defeated. And uh, I, I got so bad that I started you know, once that plan failed, I started being tempted to do something wrong. I was really tempted to go and steal that dog that I saw every day on my way to school. Um, in fact, there was a music video where he is a little kid in the video and he goes and he steals this dog out of someone's backyard. It's a pit bull too. And uh, it's his dog and he hides it up on the roof of their apartment and his mom doesn't know he has a dog. That's what happens in the music video. And so, whether that inspired my plan or whether I, I came up with my plan separately and then saw this video and related to it, I really don't remember. But I had this plan to adopt a dog, it fell apart, so now I was tempted to steal this dog. But I decided, I knew in my heart stealing was wrong, I couldn't do it. As much as I wanted and just ached to have a dog, specifically a pit bull, I knew that stealing was wrong and so I never went through with it. Um, so by the time I was 15, uh, and I don't know how much this music video influenced that idea, whether that inspired my plan or whether I, I came up with my plan separately and then saw this video and related to it, I really don't remember. But I had this plan to adopt a dog, it fell apart, so now I was tempted to steal this dog. But I decided, I knew in my heart stealing was wrong, I couldn't do it. As much as I wanted and just ached to have a dog, specifically a pit bull, I knew that stealing was wrong, and so I never went through with it. Um, so by the time I was 15, um, I, my, my parents and I decided that I was going to live with my grandfather in uh, Idaho. And my grandfather was a horse trainer. And he had, like I mentioned before, he had cattle dogs. So the first thing I did when I moved out with my grandfather, he was obviously in a situation where I could have dogs. And the very first thing, like literally weeks or a month or two after moving out, first thing I did was get a dog. I got the first dog I could get. I wasn't picky. You know, my dream was to have a pit bull, but I was happy to have anything at this point that was even remotely an outside dog. Like I really didn't want a pet, like a, like a poodle or a shih tzu or a little chihuahua or something like none of those really appealed to me at all i wanted some kind of working active outdoorsy dog um and my grandpa had a litter of puppies and they were border collies and i was like that's a outdoorsy active working dog i'm happy to have anything i can get and that was my dog uh his name was sean and i trained him to be a good cow dog and he was he he was a little bit of a hunting dog with me he wasn't good at hunting he was actually really bad at it but I liked hunting, so I'd take him out and kind of get him to do a little bit of hunting with me. And I loved this dog. I was so happy to finally have a dog. It wasn't the breed that I dreamed of, but I was happy to have anything at this point that would go out with me and hunt with me and do outdoors things with me. But I still had it kind of in the back of my mind. I wish I could have a pit bull. That was, that's my favorite breed. That's my favorite dog. 
I was happy to have any dog, but I still kind of had it in the back of my head that I wanted a pit bull. Well, we moved from Idaho to Riverton, Utah. So when we moved to Utah, um, one day at the, at the barn showed up a dog that looked just like a pit bull. Now, obviously, I don't know what it really was, how it was bred, because it just showed up out of nowhere, but it looked just like a pit bull. And I, of course, fell in love with this dog immediately because I wanted a pit bull. Now, my grandfather, the reason I hadn't gotten one earlier is my grandfather had strictly forbidden me from getting a pit bull. The reason was he had some of the same ideas that I did originally about pit bulls, some of which his ideas actually did have some merit. He wasn't as concerned with the dog attacking people, though that was a concern. His main concern was it attacking animals and livestock. Uh, seeing as we, he was a horse trainer, we had expensive horses, we had cattle, um, there were other animals around, his, his dogs, you know, his cattle dogs, that he didn't want the pit bull to hurt. Now, that is a legitimate concern. Pit bulls are animal aggressive, and even if something as big as a horse it is at significant risk to the wrong pit bull, um, they could severely hurt or even uh, drastically maim a horse. Um, same with cows, and, and definitely a border collie could easily be killed by a pit bull. So, to be honest, my grandpa did have a, a legitimate concern, but I knew that I could train a pit bull because I trained Jake, you know, that was a, a a pretty um, presumptuous opinion, right? I trained one dog, so I thought I could train them all. But I was convinced, well, I trained two dogs, Jake and then my dog, Sean. And then I trained a few like neighbor's dogs before that. But anyway, I was convinced I could train him to do anything. So I was like, oh, grandpa, you don't have to worry. If I get a pit bull, it'll be good. I won't let it get into trouble. But my grandpa said, absolutely not. So here comes this stray pit bull looking dog that showed up at the barn. What do I do? I immediately begin feeding it and showering it with pets and love, and this dog sticks around. Well, my grandpa doesn't like it, but he knows I'm in love with this dog, and so he's kind of torn as to what to do. He doesn't really do anything about it. He made it clear he was pretty annoyed about her being around, but at the same time, he didn't want to break my heart and get rid of her somehow when I was so in love with the dog. So he kind of put up with her um, is the best way to put it. And you know, she didn't get in any trouble. She didn't attack horses or cattle or, or dogs. And uh, I made a good pet out of her and I trained her up really good. And uh, I actually eventually started using her to hunt with my Border Collie. Like I said, my Border Collie was actually a really poor hunting dog. He didn't use his nose, so he didn't really track anything down or locate anything. And he was really soft. If he ever caught anything, even if it was just like a little squirrel, he would just bark at it. The only thing he would actually get a hold of was like a bunny, something that wouldn't bite back. So he was a really poor hunting dog in that he didn't use his nose and he was scared to bite stuff. The, the, the two advantages he did have was he had really good eyesight and really fast speed. Um, not as fast as, you know, greyhounds or whippets, but for a non-sight hound, he was incredibly fast. In fact, he, he was quite a bit faster than most border collies. I saw him working around a lot of other cattle dogs and he typically blew past them. So he was an unusually fast border collie, uh, according to what I'd seen. So I would use him to catch fast stuff, but as soon as he got to it, if it was anything that bit back, like a, a fox or a coyote or whatever, he'd be too intimidated to do anything beyond nip it on the butt real quick. So here comes this new pit bull dog. I named this dog uh, Baby. Now, I say pit bull dog, once again, we don't know how she was bred, but she looked like a pit bull. I trained Baby to hunt, but the great thing about Baby was she had a good nose and she liked to follow it. So I trained her to track. The downsides with her, she was kind of a stocky built dog and she wasn't as quick or athletic as Sean. So Sean and Baby became the perfect team. Baby would track it down, Sean would see it running up ahead, he would run up there, bite it on the butt, slow it down, and, and uh, Baby would come up behind and catch it whatever we have to be hunting. And they work together as a great team. And uh, I love those two dogs and Baby, uh, you know, I, I guess it was really hard to say who was my favorite because Sean was my first dog ever and Baby was my favorite breed ever. So I really loved them both uh, pretty equally, but I, I was just having so much fun. Every night after work, we, I would go hunting with these two dogs and we had so much fun. So when I started out living with my grandpa uh, when I was 15 and 16, I just trained horses for him. So he would give me the young colts that hadn't been uh, trained to ride yet. And I would teach them all the basics, how to turn, stop, 
go, you know, all the basics. And then eventually, little by little, my grandpa got me to teach them um, more complicated things like how to follow a cow and how to turn and move correctly to, to cut off a cow and things like that. But anyway, during that process, I started picking up clients of my own for training horses. Hey, can you break this horse for me? I really like how you handle horses. Hey, I, you know, I have this horse that's out of control, has some problems. Can you, you know, make it stop doing these bad habits? Sure, and I'll, I, I would train horses for people. Because I had such a good cow dog, the same thing happened when people see me work with my cow dog. Hey, I'm really impressed with your dog. Could you train mine to do the same? So I started training, you know, border collies, healers, kelpies, whatever people happen to have to do cattle work as well. So I was making money training horses and making money training dogs. And occasionally someone would have a pet that's just unruly and out of control and they'd say, hey, my pet's out of control. Could you train the, some basic obedience? And I'd say, sure. So for I built up a little bit of a business training dogs, mostly cattle dogs, but a few pets, as well as training horses. And uh, that was a fun part of my life. I really enjoyed dog training. Eventually the day came when uh, I went on my mission. So I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, a lot of people call us Mormons. And when we turn 19 years old at that time, now it's the ages have changed to 18, but at that time, um, when, the, when a young man was 19 years old, he had the opportunity, if he chose, to go on a mission. And, and girls could do the same thing. A, a young woman could decide to go on a mission. Um, when I was 19, or well, before I was 19, I made that decision that I wanted to go on a mission and so when I went on a mission, my, uh, your life changes drastically. So you travel to a new place. It could be within your own country. It could be in a different country. It just depends on where the, the church sends you. And the cho church so chose to send me to Iowa. So the mission in Iowa also had a little part of it that went into an res Indian reservation in Nebraska. The Omaha Native American uh, Indian Reservation was right on the edge of Iowa and Nebraska. And that little sliver of Nebraska was also in my mission. So while I was serving my mission, um, we, you're, you're too busy and you're not really in a position to have any kind of pets. So for one, as a missionary, you'll stay in a place for anywhere as short as like three months to as long as like maybe a year, nine months probably. A year's not really very realistic. But anyway, so anywhere from three to nine months in any given location. And um, when you're in that location, you're in a apartment and I'm going to be moving every few months. So as you can imagine, that would be a totally inappropriate situation for pets, right? You're moving every few months. You're always gone because as a missionary, you work like long days. You work from like, I think it's like 10 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., all the way to like 9, 10 p.m. So you're working roughly 12 hour days um, out you know, helping people, doing service, sharing the gospel, all of these things for a good 12 hours a day. So it's not really an appropriate situation to have pets. So I, of course, didn't have a pet. I didn't have a dog. I didn't have any other animals. And um, I dreamed about it, though. I, I still longed to have a pet. And I thought, how cool it would be to have a dog. You know, they'd come out with me as a missionary. Of course, that wouldn't be realistic because you're going into other people's homes. They don't want you to bring a dog in their house, right? But, but I dreamed about it, even though it wasn't realistic. Man, I wish I could have a dog. And one of my first areas was in a place called Waterloo, Iowa. They've got these different plants, um, like they have the John Deere uh, tractor plant, and they have a few different little plants and factories there that uh, people are drawn to for work. Well, the kind of people that did those jobs Typically, for some reason, I don't know why, I don't know exactly the correlation, but most of the people who came to do those jobs came from either the west or the south side of Chicago, which is just a state away. So, if you've ever been to Chicago or know anything about Chicago, the west and the south parts of Chicago are typically ghetto, kind of uh, rougher parts of town. And those people, for whatever reason, came from Chicago to Iowa to live. Like I said, these different factory jobs for whatever reason drew people from that specific place. Now why specifically Chicago and specifically the south side of Chicago? I have no idea to be honest. But with that came a, a kind of a ghetto culture and so in that area I saw quite a few pit bulls and of course I was just elated and I had so much fun. There'd be a guy walking down the street with his pit bull and we're out doing missionary work and I'd stop the guy and ask him about his dog and he'd tell me all about her and 
you know, and I'd be having so much fun. And my companions like, dude, will you quit talking about dogs? You know, because as a missionary, you go two by two. So you've got a, a, a missionary companion who's with you everywhere you go. So I'd be talking to these guys about dogs. And it, it was so much fun for me to be able to, you know, out doing missionary work, but still on the side kind of talking about these dogs. And that was a, that was a fun experience. Um, and then as my mission went on, I eventually got moved to an area on the Indian reservation. Um, if you've ever been to an Indian reservation, the first thing or one of the many first things you probably notice is there's a lot of stray dogs that just wander around and eat trash. Uh, these dogs are, are random mutts, typically speaking. Um, they usually have been bred among each other for many generations, kind of living this semi-wild existence, eating you know, roadkill and garbage and catching rabbits and squirrels and rats and cats and things like that to, to, to basically eke by a living. And people do feed them occasionally. People will throw some food to them. But most of what they eat, they scrounge out of the garbage or out of, you know, or catch in the wild. So there's, they live this weird kind of fa almost feral lifestyle. Um, these, what they call res dogs is, is the word that they, they give for these dogs on the Indian reservations, res dogs. And I became infatuated with learning about these res dogs. And as we went around door to door, we would get to know like a whole whole neighborhoods uh, as missionaries. And now the same applied to the reservation. So I'd quickly learn, you know, what dogs lived where. And um, pretty soon I started to pack dog food in my jacket because it was winter time. We had these big old trench coats that we'd wear and I'd pack dog food because all the res dogs look horribly skinny and, and emaciated. So I'd pack dog food in my pockets and I'd feed them whenever time I saw a dog. But you had to be careful because if you threw it, they would think you're throwing a rock at them because people are mean to the res dogs mostly, most of the time. So you don't want to throw food at them and they'll like run and hide. You had to like carefully roll dog kibble to them and they would, what, what are they doing? They'd be kind of scared at first and they'd notice, oh, that's food. And then they'd start eating it. Pretty soon I had the dogs trained. I would blow like... Once they realized, hey, this guy's feeding us, they would start following me around. And then I'd start to give a whistle every time I give them a piece of food. Whistle, food, whistle, food. And most of the dogs wouldn't eat out of your hand. You had to like throw it to them. But occasionally there'd be individuals that would get so used to us that they'd start to come and eat out of our hand. And the ones that I saw on a regular basis, they started to learn my little whistle meant, hey, he's going to give us food. Well, pretty soon these dogs would follow me. And everywhere I went as a missionary, I had this pack of dogs. And if you can imagine, we'd go to someone's house, knock on the door, we'd talk to them, they'd let us in. Well, they'd have a whole pack of dogs sitting outside their house waiting for us to come out. And then we'd go to the next place and the dogs would follow us everywhere we went. Because, you know, we walked everywhere we went uh, on the reservation. And um, the dogs would just follow me. And that was great fun. That was a fun experience. And I could tell stories forever about the res dogs. Um, I guess I'll keep it to a, a, a few select dogs. Um, there was one time we were walking and we saw there was this big ravine and people had pushed old cars off the, the ravine, into the ravine. So they crashed down in the bottom of the ravine and then water would flow and cover these dogs with, these dogs, cover these cars with mud and dirt and stuff. And these, these cars were like really old, like 50, 60 years old, uh, ancient, crushed, demolished, like they were basically just chunks of scrap metal at this point. You can't really call them cars. But they are mostly covered with dirt because of the water running down the ravine whenever they had big big rainstorms and stuff. And the dogs would go under these cars and use them as den sites. Well, we saw one day a little puppy, well, a whole, whole litter of puppies outside their den. And I ran up there and they all run up under the car except for the last one was too slow. And I caught it. And she was a skinny little runt uh, that wasn't doing very good, wasn't getting enough food. And that was why she was the slowest one to get in. And I could tell she was really hurting for food. So I left all the food in my pocket. I dumped it all out right in front of their den so that they could come come eat it. And I took this little puppy home and we fed her and took care of her and got her wormed and vaccinated and fattened her up a little bit. Well, as I mentioned before, it wasn't really appropriate for me to have a dog as a pet, as a missionary, I didn't have time for it. You know, I'd be out all day and this little puppy couldn't just like follow me as we went out and taught people. It was too little. So I found a home and um, got him a good home, someone that would take care of it, love it, 
keep it inside, not just let it run around wild like, like is common in that uh, culture. Found something that would take care of it and I gave him that puppy and I was pretty happy to save that little puppy and give it a good home. One day, I, we were out walking and uh, we found a dog that had been hit by a car and it had drug itself off the road a ways and was laying in the middle of this field and it was just beat up. The poor thing, one of its legs, its front leg was broken so that it flopped like this but not where the joint was, like in the middle of the bone. It flopped like this. It was just totally broken. It's All the skin was gone from the inside of its legs. Like it looked horrible. And they don't really have like animal shelters or veterinarians or anything like that on the, on the Indian reservation. People just don't care about dogs there. In fact, they often shoot them so that they don't have too many. Guys will go around with guns and just shoot the dogs to reduce the population. That's That's basically how they deal with dogs there. And so there was nobody I could really go to to say, hey, can you help me take care of this dog? There were no veterinarians, like I said, no animal shelters. There's nothing we could do. And um, I felt like, you know what? Even if we took this dog to a vet, it's probably gonna die anyway. She just looks horrible. So as horrible as I felt, there was nothing I could do. I didn't have a gun or anything to put her down with. Honestly, as cruel as it sounds, if I had had a gun, I would have shot her, put her out of her misery, because she just looked horrible. And like I said, I was convinced she was gonna die anyway. But I didn't have a gun, I didn't have any way to easily put her out of her misery. Um, and I didn't have the heart to do it any other you know, method. So I just said, well, you know what, I'll let nature take its course. I'm sure she'll be dead within a few hours anyway. So we went home. Uh, I actually got her a bowl of water and I brought her some water and I gave her a little food just to comfort her before death. You know, Not that I thought it was gonna help her get better. But I gave her some water and she drank it. She didn't want any food. And I thought, well, that at least she can die in a little more comfort, because um, I know I've I've gone and I've had some pretty rough accidents back when I was training horses, and I know that as soon as you get hurt really bad, a lot of times you kind of go into shock. And one of the things that happens when you start going into shock is for some reason you want you get thirsty. And so I thought, well, and and I was right. She's probably thirsty, and I gave her water and she drank it. We left her there to to let nature take its course. The next day we came out to get the dish because I assumed she'd already died. So I went to get the water bowl away and put it away, and lo and behold, she was still alive. And I'm like, huh, that's weird. I thought for sure you'd be dead. So I gave her a little more food. She'd eaten the food by then that I'd left her, um, which when I first gave it to her, she wouldn't eat it. But by this point, the food was gone. So either she ate it or some other wild dog run, around, run up and ate it. So I thought, well, here's some more food. She ate the food. Um, I got her more water in the dish, and I said, well, I hope you're a little more comfortable before you die, you know, good luck with your passing. And I left the dog expecting it to be dead the next time I came by. I came back on the way home at the end of the day, there was the dog still alive. I was really surprised. So once again, gave her more food, gave her more water. There wasn't really much else I could do for her. As harsh as it sounds, I wasn't in a position to take this dog and take care of it. And there wasn't really anyone around who cared about dogs, like I said, in that culture you just run them over your car or shoot them. Like they, they have no uh, empathy with, for dogs, generally speaking, most people don't. So I'm like, well, there's nothing I can do. And I, I went home and the next day there was a big snowstorm. And I woke up and there was, there was a big uh, uh, snow coming down like crazy. Another thing you have to realize too is the dogs aren't really like tame, cuddly pets. So it wasn't like I could just pick her up and bring her home. She would have attacked me, right? Even, even tame dogs, when they're injured, if you pick them up, they're probably gonna bite you. Well, this is a wild, feral dog. If I touch her, she's gonna bite me. So, I mean, I wasn't being totally heartless. I was being pretty reasonable. I mean, you can't pick up a wild animal and just bring him home with you. He's gonna bite you. Well, now, there was a blizzard happening, and this dog had survived for two days, so it looked like she might actually make it. And now she's out stuck in this blizzard. And I said, you know what? Enough is enough. I don't care if I get bit, I'm gonna try and save this dog. So I took one of my ties and I run out there to see if she was still alive. I mean, she might've died by then. I got there, she's still alive. So I take my tie and I try and tie it around her mouth and make a, a makeshift muzzle so she doesn't bite me. And I pick her up and the tie just falls off. <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy, well, if she bites me, she bites me. And I took her home, but she never bit me. So a miracle, for some reason, she didn't bite me. I guess she realized I was helping her because I'd been bringing her food and water and stuff. Maybe she realized I was helping her, so she didn't bite me. So I brought her home and we put her in um, a little place where she's nice and warm and dry and we took care of her. Eventually she got better 
and we'd start once it warmed up again and all the snow melted because this was spring it was a, a freak snowstorm in spring it wasn't winter so once the snow melted it got warm again we put, moved her back outside and just left her on our front lawn and we kept feeding her and taking care of her and we made a little bed a little shelter for her out of blankets under our porch so she could sleep under the porch or move out into the the yard if she wanted to and that's where we kept her and took care of her once it warmed up again and, and thawed out so little by little she got stronger and she started trying to follow us well she can't because she's got a broken leg and she's all messed up but she's had like i don't know a couple weeks to heal so she starts trying to follow us and hobble around and follow us and we're like no so we're going out to do missionary work we're going to be walking all day long we're like dog you can barely walk across the street you can't follow us so we started sneaking out the back door so we had a, we lived in a trailer on the reservation they didn't have apartment buildings like they do in uh, no, normal cities so we lived on a trailer that was right next to the church house and so there was a front door and a back door so we'd sneak out the back door and run away so the dog didn't notice us and try and follow us and eventually I got talking to a lady and I said we've got this dog that we saved they got hit by a car um, I want to give her an Indian name what's a cool name in Omaha that would describe this dog and how she's such a you know a, a tough survivor and the lady said you should name her Wasisige. Wasisige in Omaha means tough survivor. And I'm like, oh, that's perfect. We'll call her Wasisige. So pretty soon, Wasisige started to get stronger and more healthy. And she started to learn our little trick when we'd go around and go out the back door. And she'd hobble around and see us leaving. And so she'd come to keep up with us. At that point, she was strong enough that it was kind of okay for her to follow us. I still felt bad for her. She wasn't really strong enough to keep up, but she did her best to follow us around when we did missionary work. And I would tell people, they're like, what's this dog following you? I'm like, oh, that's my dog. And they're like, really? What's her name? I'm like, her name's Wasisige. And they would laugh at me. And I thought, oh, they think it's funny because this, this white guy's speaking Omaha, right? Ha ha ha, they're laughing at me because I speak Omaha. Well, one day, finally, I run into this old man and he said, what's your dog's name? And I said, Wasisige. And he, he laughed at me, he said, son you're speaking like a woman and i'm like oh okay what does that mean and he's like in omaha women say words differently than men because if you remember it was an old lady who taught me the word wasisige she taught me how to say it as a woman <laughs> so in in omaha the men say words differently than women say them so kind of like if you guys know conjugations in spanish or, or portuguese or stuff like that the word, instead of being conjugated on the, 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 the subject that you're talking about, so you're talking about a, a woman, you, you say it one way, you talk about a man, you say it another way. Well, in Omaha, instead of it being on the subject, it's based on the person speaking. So I was saying the word like a woman. Anyway, now I knew finally why everyone was laughing at me every time I said wasisige. He's like, no, it's wasisiga. You're a man, speak like a man, wasisiga. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I feel like an idiot. So Wasisiga, she was a great dog and she followed us around. Um, in fact, she, uh, she only followed us when we were walking. So we did have a car on the reservation. We just didn't drive it very often because we only had a limited amount of, of income, right? Because we saved up our money to go on a mission. So we don't have a lot to spend. So we only had a limited amount of miles that we could drive every single month. So we saved the miles just for when we had to drive to go grocery shopping or visit other towns. When we were in the hometown of Macy, Nebraska, we didn't drive, we just walked. Well, the dog learned whenever we got in the car to drive away, just stay home. Just stay where you're at, we'll be back, and just stay at the home and wait for us. But if we tried to walk anywhere, like I said, she would follow us. Well, one day, we went to uh, a family's home and they, they invited us to stay for dinner. And so we ate dinner with them. And um, one thing about the reservations is when it gets dark at night, it's kind of a little bit dangerous to be out alone in the dark. Well, not alone, but, but I mean, you need a group of people and there's just two of us as missionaries, right? So when we got done with dinner, the member said, hey, let us drive you home. It's got, it, you know, it's pretty dark out. We don't want you going home in the dark. And they're like, okay, sure, we'd, we'd love that, thanks. So the problem was we had Wasisiga outside the door waiting for us. So as we did missionary work, we would go in and teach people for an hour or two at a time, and the dog would wait outside the house. 
And then we get them, come out and we go and walk to another house and we go teach people the gospel for a half an hour to an hour or two hours or whatever it was. And the dog would wait outside the house. So she was used to waiting for us. When we got done with, the, with, with our dinner and we got in the, the, the family's car and they drove us home, Wasisiga did what she usually did, which is when we drive away in a car, she just waits for us. And I expected she knew her way home. Like we literally went out all day long walking the neighborhood and went back to our home every single day. I figured Wasisiga would just be like, oh, I guess they're going home and then find her way home. She didn't though. When we woke up in the morning, there was no Wasisiga. I'm like, what the heck? Where is she? So we were really worried. So we got, we went out and we were calling her and looking for her. And we looked and looked, looked. I don't like, I don't even know where to look. She should be home. Why didn't she come home? So we went back to the, the home where we had dinner the night before. And there she was waiting for us at the house. And I was like, easily dog, why didn't you come home? And I thought, man, what a devoted individual. This dog sat and waited for us all night long, expecting us to come out of that house and never left. What a, what a sweet individual, you know? So um, another funny story was, you know, when we'd go around, there was other dogs that would follow us, like I mentioned before, because I'd feed them. So they knew, hey, we're food. And, the, and I would teach them stuff. I would teach them to come. I would teach them to sit, you know, different tricks. Well, another thing we do is when we're walking around, sometimes we would see uh, like a little rabbit run through the bushes, which uh, rabbits aren't very common on the reservations because there's so many dogs. You know, any slow rabbits gets picked off and eaten by a dog. Well, the ones that survive are really good at escaping dogs. So whenever we see a bunny, I'd sick the dogs on them just for fun to watch them chase it because they never caught it. The rabbit always escaped. So we'd see a rabbit and I'd go, the, the natives, uh, at least in Omaha, uh, or the Omaha tribe, I should say, uh, when they're sicking a dog on something, they make this sound, which you guys are probably quite familiar of if you've watched any of my ratting videos. The sound is I picked that up from being on the Omaha Indian Reservation. I didn't know that sound before. Uh, before when I had cattle dogs and I would tell them to grab a cow, I'd say, get him, get him, get him, get him. Come on, get a hold of him. That was what I said. I didn't do this thing. But I learned from the Indian boys, the native boys, to go So I did the same thing with my res dogs. We go out, we'd see a bunny and I'd go and I'd point to where I see the bunny and they'd go in the direction and they'd chase it. And I don't, like I said, always escaped. Well, my dogs were very accustomed to this and me pointing and knowing to go where I'm pointing and, and that sound means I see something to get. Well, one day we're out and this, this big German Shepherd looking dog started following us around. He'd been following us around for a few weeks and um, along with some other mangy looking things was this big, beautiful German Shepherd looking dog. I have no idea if it was purebred or if it just looked like a German Shepherd, but it was, it was a big old dog. Well, one day we, we, we ended up staying out a little too late and we were w walking on our way home. And on our way home, uh, they have street lights, but they're kind of spread out. So you'd have these dark patches and then one street light and the dark patch. So we're walking and we, we're in the street light so people could see us. And there's some, some, a bunch of uh, teenagers hanging out in a, in a kind of a group up on top of this hill. And they see us missionaries walking down by ourselves in the dark alone. So they start harassing us and they start yelling down the hill things at us and and all of this stuff acting quite aggressive like they're going to do something to us. And uh, I, we're looking up and we're like, eh, what are these, what are these kids going to do? You know, you never know. And uh, there's a group of them. So we're walking and they don't see any of the dogs. Um, all of our dogs are walking in the shadows and we were walking in the street in the light and the dogs are off in the shadows. So they didn't see any of the dogs with us, more specifically the big German Shepherd. They just saw us alone. So they're making fun of us and being kind of rude and rowdy and, and kind of acting like they're going to be aggressive towards us. And so I look up at them and I point right at the group of, of teenagers up on the hill and I point right at them and I go, now being natives themselves, they know what means. That was a very clear thing that I was sicking the dogs on them. Well, none of my dogs were human aggressive. They, they were just random street dogs, right? But they knew when I went and pointed that I saw a bunny. So the whole pack of dogs takes off up the hill, one of which is a big old intimidating looking German Shepherd. And they're all running straight at the kids. 
Well, the dogs, they think I see a bunny and they're frantically looking for a bunny to chase. The young, the young hoodlums, they think the dogs are coming to kill them because I just told them in, in Omaha, the native command to kill them. <laughs> and I point and all the dogs run at them. So they're like, oh no, ah, and they're all scattering and falling all over the place and running from the dogs. The dogs aren't even after them. The dogs are looking for a bunny. It was the funniest thing ever. I'll never forget that. They were just panicked and running and, and thinking the dogs were after them. And like I said, one of these dogs, there was like four or five dogs, but one of them was a big, big, intimidating looking shepherd. So I don't blame them for running. <laughs> Wasisiga, eventually when I uh, moved from the Indian reservation to another area on my mission, I couldn't take her for reasons I've, I've described. And so I found a good uh, home with some kids that would love her and take care of her. And I gave Wasisi got to them. And it was so sad watching her, um, you know, walk off with those kids, but she was so happy to be with them. And it broke my heart. I love that dog, but, but it was the right thing to do. So the end of my mission, um, I actually tried to get my parents to take her. I, I called them and said, Hey, cause my family, um, they, they lived in the Chicagoland area. They weren't too far away. I was like, Hey, you guys want to come get this? <laughs> you guys want to come get this res dog and have a pet res dog? And they're like, "Yeah, no, we just got a puppy." And I'm like, "You guys just got a puppy?" Yeah, we got a puppy. I wanted a puppy all growing up, and you never got a puppy, and now you've got a puppy. They're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Well, what kind of puppy is it?" And my dad said, "Some." American Terrier, some goofy thing that is not a breed. And I'm like, American Terrier? What's an American Terrier? So they were afraid to tell me what it really was. Uh, so they sent me a picture. Guess what it was? Well, guess what it looked like, I should say. I don't know what it was because they just got the dog from some neighbor. So I don't know what this breed, it, what breed the dog is for sure. We just know what it looks like. And it looked exactly like a pit bull, an American Pit Bull Terrier. That's what it looked like. And that's what my dad was trying to say without saying that it was a pit bull. He's like, it's an American terrier. <laughs> I'm like, dad, you're a dork. It's a pit bull. Come on. So at least it looked like a pit bull, I should say. So anyway, I was like jealous and excited and like, my gosh, I wanted a pit bull my whole life. And here you guys finally get a family dog for the first time ever in the whole existence of my family. And you get a pit bull or at least one that looks like a pit bull. So anyway, I was like, well, yeah, I get it. You guys have a new dog. You can't take Wasisiga. So I found Wasisiga home. So they got the pup. It was, you know, like seven, eight weeks old. But by the time I got home from my mission, she was seven months old. So this puppy uh, had grown up a little bit. She was still young, but she'd grown up and matured quite a bit. And when I got home, I found out she was absolutely super, super aggressive towards every living creature except for humans. She's very friendly and sweet to people, but absolutely vicious towards any other animal. Didn't matter if it was something big, little, whether it was a mouse, a sparrow, another dog, a horse, a cow, everything. She wanted to get her teeth into it. Absolutely bonkers when it comes to dog aggression. They could not take her on a walk. Even though she was a small dog, she was only uh, 38 pounds as an adult. So I, my guess is at this point in her life, she's probably less than 30 pounds. So she's a little dog, uh, probably a little under 30 pounds or low 30s at the most. And yet, so it wasn't like she was big and like dragging him down the street or anything, but she was a powerful dog and he, he, despite her small size and she was super intense. They couldn't take her on walks because if she saw a dog, whether it was you know, a block away, two blocks away, it didn't matter if it was behind a chain link fence or, or on a leash, if she saw another dog, she would just go crazy trying to get it. And um, she wanted to get squirrels and rabbits and stuff too, but she was super, super fight crazy. She really wanted to grab another dog. My parents are like, man, we just don't know what we're gonna do with this dog. We love her to death, but we can't take her anywhere because she just wants to fight every dog she sees. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're worried there's gonna be an issue. So I'm like, ah, let me, let me see what I can do with her. So I took this dog and I started training her and she was, you know, completely untrained and, and didn't have any manners or, or basic training at all. So I trained her all the basics and taught her what to do and what not to do. And um, the first thing I trained her to not do was uh, my mom got a little parakeet. Uh, this was 
you know, maybe a, a month or two after I got home from a mission, she got a little parakeet and that dog wanted to kill that parakeet. She was really wanted to kill it. And so I had to teach her, hey, you leave that parakeet alone. Um, so I started to channel her aggression towards specific animals that we could hunt, raccoons and possums and rabbits. Um, so I taught her, yeah, Benny does not want to be on my lap. So I taught her, hey, you could get bunnies, you can get squirrels, though you're realistically not going to get very many squirrels. You can get raccoons, you can get possums. But everything else, leave it alone. Don't chase deer, don't fight with dogs, don't kill parakeets. You know, leave that stuff alone. And I channeled her aggression mostly towards raccoons and possums. Let's, let's focus on finding raccoons, killing raccoons and possums, and let's leave everything else alone. So it took some work, but eventually she was totally broke from dog aggression. She wouldn't attack other dogs. In fact, I got her to the point where another dog could confront her or even attack her and she wouldn't fight back, not with her teeth. She would actually, funny enough, she would actually wrestle with the dog, but not bite him because she knew she wasn't allowed to. Um, when it comes to raccoons, when it comes to possums, she was just bonkers for catching them. And um, we had a lot of fun catching rabbits and, 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 uh, and raccoons and possums with her. And I, I, I stayed there um, for a year after my mission, living with my family, and I trained that dog to hunt everything. It was so much fun. And I had a lot of fun with that dog, and I, I absolutely loved her, um, but it was my mom's dog. So when I moved out, you know, I had to leave her there. <laughs> and I'd come visit whenever I'd come back for Christmas or whatever to visit my family, and it'd be great. I'd see, her name was Mitzi. I'd see Mitzi again, and oh, I loved her, and we'd go out hunting for the few weeks I was visiting home. We would just go hunt and hunt and hunt, and then I'd have to go back uh, where I'd moved to, I moved back to Utah. Um, I'd have to go back to Utah and then I wouldn't see her for another year. So every time I went back home to visit, I'd go take Mitzi hunting. Um, it was great fun. So finally, um, as my life progressed, I got into mink, as you would know, if you've heard that story before, if you haven't, I'll put a link in the description below for that story. If you haven't heard how I got into mink. So as I got into training mink, I started to see the value in possibly getting a dog. At the time, I wasn't just doing pest control with my mink, I was actually doing a lot of rabbit hunting. So there was a lot of, of rabbits uh, close to where I lived in Utah, and I could travel, you know, 20, 30 minutes and go to a place where there's just tons and tons of rabbits everywhere. And we had a lot of fun hunting those rabbits with my mink. The problem was um, when the rabbit ran out of the hole, the dog, uh, you know, it was gone. There, we had nothing to catch it. The mink isn't gonna go run across a field and catch a rabbit. It had to be hiding. The other problem is we didn't know where the rabbits were hiding without just sticking the mink down there. And the mink might spend 15, 20 minutes in a hole before finally it moves on to another hole. So it would have been very useful for us to know which holes and, and um, junk piles and, and, and such have a rabbit hiding in them and it would be useful to have a dog that would chase the rabbit once it come out of the hole. Well, my buddy, Cade, he got one such a dog. He got a dog that he named Carl. And Carl was an interesting mix. He was a border collie mixed with a Catahoula, mixed with a feral hound. So he had a little bit of sight hound in there according to the, the guys he got it from. And he was mostly collie. So he was a pretty quick dog. And he worked great for that job. He would show us where the rabbits were and he would chase them when they come out of the hole but he really wasn't fast enough to catch a rabbit in a fair chase. He was a quick dog, don't get me wrong, but he wasn't really fast enough. Well, I saw all the fun things that Carl could do. He actually helped us a lot with ratting. He would show us where the rats were. We could put the mink down, and then when the, mink, when the rats run out, he'd be there to catch the rats. And I saw the value in having a dog working with the mink. He was great for helping us find rats, great for helping us catch rats, great for helping us find rabbits, and he, though he didn't catch very many rabbits, he, he was good having him to, there to chase the rabbits when they come out of the hole. Because oftentimes they would go and hide again and then we could put the mink down. So he was a really cool dog. But I thought, you know what? I want a dog like Carl, but I want one that's even faster than Carl so that we could catch more rabbits and hopefully even catch jackrabbits, which are even faster than the bunnies we were catching with, with the mink. And so my goal was to get a really fast dog, but I didn't want a specialist. I didn't want a greyhound that was just purely bred for running down and catching 
uh, you know, hare and rabbits. I wanted something that could do a couple different jobs. You know, the rats, catching the rats, had a good nose for locating rats, locating uh, rabbits. And I also had the idea that it would be cool to have a dog that can locate a lost mink as well. So I wanted a dog with a good nose, but a lot of speed. So kind of a versatile dog. And that got me into the interest of getting what they call a lurcher. What a lurcher is, is a cross between a, a sight hound, like a greyhound or a whippet, with some other useful working dog. I found a lady in New Mexico that had what was, a, what was called a pointer lurcher. It was an English pointer crossed with a, a, essentially a greyhound. I, I, I liked that idea, but I wanted something that had more of the pointer in it for a better nose. But unfortunately, I couldn't find anything with any more than one eighth pointer. Uh, here in the US, uh, they just don't have a lot of lurchers available. Now, now that I've, I've gotten to know more dogmen, I actually have a lot more access to more lurchers than I did back then. But at the time, I didn't have very many connections. So I was pretty limited to my choices, and this was a dog that had a little bit of pointer in it, so I thought, well, it should have a better nose than a pure greyhound, and I'll have plenty of speed, so this should be a great fit. I went and got the puppy, and I named her Onsa. And Onsa was an amazing dog. She turned on very, very early. In fact, I got her, I think she was 11 weeks old when I got her, roughly, like 11, maybe 13, something like that. So she was a little bit of an older puppy, but still a puppy, very much a puppy. And man, she was on fire. The earliest starting puppy I think I've ever seen. Uh, Bindi came close though. Bindi was a pretty early starter. But I think she even had more fire than Bindi. Man, she wanted to get my mink. She wanted to get anything that moved. I had to teach her, hey, from the very first day, even though she was only 11 weeks old, I had to teach her, hey, leave the mink alone. Mink are off limits. Here, you can get a bunny. You can get a rat. You can get other stuff, but you can't get the mink. And so I taught her, hey, leave the mink alone. And she grew up with my mink. Fang. And her and Fang became the best of buddies. And man, that Onsa dog was so handy and so fun. But the unfortunate thing was, right about the time that I got her, they had a big construction crew come through and destroy all of my rabbit fields. All of the places that I previously hunted bunnies, which I had tons of bunnies to hunt there, they were all mowed over and turned into apartment or to uh, um, neighborhoods and apartment complexes and stores and all kinds of stuff and my my rabbit hunting was done i now had to travel an hour or more just to go to a rabbit hunting area and so here i was with this amazingly fast dog and like very little opportunity to ever hunt rabbits i was just absolutely heartbroken the other thing was rabbit populations go through cycles they go through a roughly 10 to 7 year cycle which means at the peak of the cycle, their populations are just exploding. There's bunnies everywhere. And at the, the bottom, the trough of the cycle, the, the bunnies are a lot more scarce. And then slowly the population builds back up and then there's a bunch of them everywhere, you know. And that happens roughly every seven to 10 years. Well, right when I got uh, Onsa, it was at the peak of the rabbit population. So not only did I have some good close places to hunt, but everywhere you went, there were bunnies and lots and lots of bunnies. I mean, it was, it was almost epidemic proportions how many bunnies we had. As soon as Onsa was old enough to hunt, there were no bunnies. The population crashed and crashed hard because it had had such an over, uh, overabundant number of bunnies for a couple of years. It crashed so hard that there was almost no bunnies. So not only did I lose all my good close hunting, but when I traveled, the bunnies were quite scarce, just due to natural cycles in the bunny populations. So I was quite sad. I, here I had this amazing fast dog, and we would travel, you know, a couple hours and barely see a bunny. And we had some fun, we caught some bunnies with her, but it, it really was kind of a waste having such a fast dog, when really, we only caught a, bunnies on occasion, and typically we stuck to catching rats and muskrats. Though I say it was a waste, she was actually really good at catching muskrats. So she was a pretty fun dog. Well, around that time, I also started doing a little more uh, raccoon pest control. Now, raccoons are an invasive species here in the state of Utah, and they cause a lot of ecological problems because they're non-native. Uh, raccoons actually get easily overpopulated, even where they are native, and they cause a lot of problems because of that. 
um, they're actually a very, very wasteful predator. So if they find like a duck, uh, a duck nest, they don't just eat one or two eggs, they're full and they leave it. They destroy all 12 eggs. They eat one or two or three and then they're full. So they break all the rest of the eggs and leave the rest to rot. Um, same thing with like a cornfield. They'll pull a stalk of corn down, take a bite, leave it to rot. Pull another stalk, take a bite, leave it to rot. So whereas they normally would be full after like two or three cobs of corn, they, they massacre like 50, 60, 70 cobs of corn, pushing down stock after stock after stock, taking one bite and moving on to the next. They're a very, very, very wasteful creature, and they easily get overpopulated. Well, you add that to the fact that they're a non-native invasive species here in our state. First one ever being uh, documented in 1952. Um, they have since spread and really crazed, created quite the nuisance here in our state. So because of that, I, you know, as you guys know, I hunt a lot of <laughs> in troublesome species, a lot of pests that cause problems. And so I started hunting raccoons with my Ulta dog. Now she was of course far from the ideal raccoon dog, right? She's, she's not very good at the brush. Um, she, she's got a nose, but not the best nose. And she doesn't really like getting into tight places, which raccoons love to hide in tight places, whether it's thick brush, whether it's down in culverts, you know, brush piles. They like tight places. And so Onso was far from the ideal dog for hunting raccoons, but she caught quite a few and, and was, you know, relatively good at it considering her weaknesses. But that wasn't the purpose I got her for. So obviously uh, she wasn't the ideal dog for it either. So in addition to doing more raccoon hunting than I expected with Onsa, we actually grew significantly when it came to our ratting. Uh, previously, when, when I was thinking about getting Ulta, ratting was not top of mind. I didn't do very much ratting. But word had started to spread about my abilities to take care of rodent problems. And so more and more people were asking me to come and take care of the rat problems. So as I had Ulta, it became a bigger and a bigger part of what I do. I was starting to become a, a second income going out and taking care of these rats. So. Though when I got Onsa, I didn't really have ratting in mind, it actually transitioned to start becoming one of her main jobs, which was ca was catching rats. And she was really good at it, so it worked out great. Well, the day came when uh, the unfortunate accident happened where Onsa uh, got hit by a car. So Onsa, we had a fenced backyard. We would let her out to go to the bathroom, but most of the time she just stayed inside with us. She was a real couch potato and just laid in her, her little soft bed next to us and stayed inside. Um, I was at work one day, my wife let her out in the backyard to go to the bathroom, and she'd never jumped the fence, even though she, she could, she very easily could, she never jumped the fence. So we didn't worry about leaving her in the backyard for a few minutes to go to the bathroom. But that particular day, for whatever reason, she decided to jump the fence, and she wandered into the front yard where right in front of her house, she was hit by a truck and killed. He was an absolutely devastating loss for me. I'd put a lot of love and effort into that dog and she was gone. Um, I was just absolutely devastated. I soon realized that not only was this gonna be an emotional uh, experience, but also financially, I'd started to build an income on doing pest control for rats. And now I had no dog. I of course still had my mink, but I needed a dog to work with that mink. And I'd learned what a valuable asset having the dog uh, there to work with the mink. It was more than just valuable. It was it was absolutely necessary. I, I really couldn't do pest control with just the mink. So I needed a dog and I needed a dog fast. I had a good buddy of mine reach out to me and he offered me a male dog. He was young, uh, basically an old pup, I should say. I was going to say a young dog, but I, I'd more refer to him as an old pup. He was uh, five, almost six months old. And he said, hey, you can have this dog. I'm like, well, I really don't want a male. And uh, he was the one named Boss. Uh, the previous owner had actually already named him Boss. So he was one quarter pit bull at three eighths whippet and three eighths greyhound. And I thought, man, that would be an awesome ratting dog. I would, I, I just, I'm not super interested in males. But he said, well, think about it. And I said, okay. Well, I, another dog came about that was offered to me and it was a dog who I ended up naming Lily. And she was a yellow uh, greyhound, essentially. She was a stag hound, so she was actually a mix of different sighthounds, but 
mostly Greyhound. She was a female. And the lady gave her to me. She said, hey, you know what? I don't think she's going to get big enough for catching coyotes. That's what they used their dogs for. So I think you, you could just have this one. She's kind of small. I think she'll work for what you want to do. So I'm like, huh, well, I've got two dogs to choose from. Two, and they were the same age, both of them almost six months old. So I'm like, huh, I've got two dogs to choose from. And I talked to my buddy about it. I'm like, I'll be honest, I like the sounds of your dog better, but I want a female. And I like this other dog's a female, but I don't think she sounds as good as your dog. And he's like, well, why are you trying to choose between the two? Take them both and then keep the one you like. And I'm like, huh, good point. And he said, yeah, if you don't like Boss, send him back to me. Like, I don't really want to get rid of Boss. He is the pick of the litter that I chose for myself. I'm only offering him to you because you're in a, a tight spot and you need a dog. So if you don't like him, just send him back to me and I'll keep him. And I said, you know what? I'll do that. So I got both Boss and Lily. Lily, if you guys remember, she didn't turn out. She had no interest in chasing anything. Well, maybe chasing or following something, but she wouldn't catch anything. Rats, rabbits, nothing. <laughs> like she just, just didn't have any interest in that. Boss, as you guys know, turned into a, a, a main part of what I do. Maybe he's just a phenomenal ratting dog, a good raccoon hunting dog. He's just great. Up until this point, if you think about it, so as a, when I was young, what was I obsessed with? Well, first Labradors, of course, but, but once I got into my teen years, what was I obsessed with? Pit bulls. I always wanted a pit bull. So you may wonder, okay, why are you getting these lurchers? You know, Ulta the pointer lurcher, Boss the bull lurcher. Why aren't you getting a pit bull? Well, I learned from my grandpa working on the ranch and, and working with animals that you get the animal that fits your goal. You don't just, you don't just have animals for the sake of having them in his opinion, right? This is how I was raised. Animals have a purpose and you get the animal that works for the purpose that you need. Um, if you want a cattle horse, right? You're gonna go out and rope cows and, and move cows. You don't get a Clydesdale. It doesn't matter how much you love Clydesdales. Clydesdales are big and beautiful and cool. Yeah, but they're not a good cow horse. They're too clumpy, they're awkward, they're slow, they're powerful but they're not very athletic and nimble. They're not a good cow horse, you know? It makes sense. If you want a cow horse, you get a quarter horse or something like it. You don't get a Clydesdale, no matter how much you love Clydesdales, right? And so the jobs that I had for a pit bull weren't really like ideal for pit bulls. Like when I'm gonna get a pit bull that's really tough dog to kill rats, I mean, it would work, but why not get a dog that's more specific to that job, right? was were my thought process. And so I you know, didn't really see the need, even though I had a, a, I still had that interest in pit bulls, but I was more, more focused on what fit the job best. You know, a quick athletic lurcher for snatching rats or a little terrier for fitting in the tight spots for rats, right? Little dog to get in the tight spots, fast dog to catch the rats running across the field. That was my team, right? As you guys remember, I got these little terriers and I had my lurcher. Well, also, we started doing more pest control for other animals like beavers and raccoons. I would use the little terriers to go down a beaver hole, chase the beaver out, and then I would get the beaver. I don't let the dogs attack the beaver. I get the beaver, but the dogs would chase it out of the hole. Well, a lot of times in those holes were raccoons. Unfortunately, in most of the situations where I'm doing pest control, they want those, those animals out of the holes because they don't want the flood risk that they create by digging in the banks of the canals and such. So what happens if I catch a raccoon down in that beaver hole? I can't, like, they don't want me in there digging them out, right? And that's what you do with terriers. They get in there with a, with a raccoon and they fight with the raccoon and you dig them out and then you dispatch the raccoon because most terriers realistically aren't gonna dispatch their own raccoon. And if they do, they're gonna take a lot of a, a, a significant beating before they're done killing the raccoon. So it's just not realistic to expect a terrier to do that. So it's also not a good idea for me to be digging up these holes. The other thing is sometimes the raccoons aren't in a beaver hole. Sometimes there are people calling me, hey, there's a raccoon under our shed, or there's a raccoon up in an attic, or there's a raccoon, you know, in these other places. Once again, a tight place where you need a small dog, but it's not realistic to expect a terrier to go in and just kill a raccoon. All of a sudden I realized, hey, 
you know, I think there is a dog that would be small enough to fit down a lot of these holes, not all of them, but a lot of these holes, but strong enough and powerful enough to actually dispatch the raccoon when he gets there. And I realized, hey, back when I was a teenager, I was loved with and obsessed with pit bulls. You know, I've kind of, in a way, forgotten that as I grew up and got into these, these hunting and working dogs. But now I had another reason, a legitimate reason to get a pit bull. And that's what led me to get Bindi. And that's a whole nother story, all the effort I went to finding just the right dog and just the right pit bull. But that's basically leads me back to where we are today. And then we have the dogs we have today. We've got the fast lurcher. Tag is supposed to be that dog. We'll see. We've got our, our little terriers like Gypsy for getting them in tight spots. And then we have Bindi. She's my mini muscle. That's the idea behind her. Get in those tight spots. Not the super tight spots, of course, because she can't fit. She's 35 pounds. She's not going to fit where a 25-pound Patterdale is going to fit, right? But she'll fit in a lot of those tight spots that, like, 65-pound Boss could never fit in. Um, or 65-pound Onsa would never fit in, even if she could. She's unwilling to go in tight spots. And you got Bindi, the 35-pound little muscle, to get in those tight spots, get the raccoon, and, and finish it without me having to dig down and help her, right? And so that's the idea behind Bindi. So after all these years and all that, you know, dreaming as a kid of having a pit bull and wanting a pit bull for so long, and then realizing as an adult, hey, it's probably not the most ideal dog for what I'm doing, so I'm not gonna have one. Now I finally have a legitimate reason in my mind to have a purebred pit bull and a real pit bull, working bred, legit dog. And so I went through a lot of effort selecting Bindi and I'm super proud of her man she's turned into a great dog and she's ended up being a significantly better ratting dog than I was expecting I wasn't thinking she'd be bad at it but I didn't really expect her to be great at it and and she's really I would say great at it she's quicker and more nimble than than Leia just by a little bit I was surprised by that I expected Leia to be quicker and more nimble but I think I think she's faster than Leia and she's far more intelligent than any of the dogs I have right now. She can figure out where the rat's gonna go and be there before the rat gets away. She's, she's a smart, athletic, and super handy rat dog. But of course, that's not what I got her for. I got her for the, the more difficult uh, task of getting raccoons out of you know difficult places, pipes, holes, under sheds, stuff like that. And she's phenomenal at that job too. So really happy with Bindi and uh, yeah, that uh, just basically leads you from my story of dogs from the beginning of me wanting a Labrador as a little boy and dreaming of using a Labrador to help me find turtles all the way up till now. And here I am, um, you know, making a, a living working with my dogs. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed that story. I know it was a pretty long winded story, um, but I gave you guys all the details I could think of uh, as we went along. So I hope you found it interesting. So thanks for watching, guys. We'll show you more next time.